Uh, so thank you everyone for for joining us. Thank you for for this session. For in in this session, we we've got a a basic question. The the question that we are asking is: Do universities have an obligation to prevent mass atrocities? And um, some of the questions that we are asking as part of this session is: Are uh, perhaps your university association or union? has issued one or more statements on Israel's assault on Palestinians in Gaza, the West Bank, and East Jerusalem. And we're asking if you'd be interested in reading or discussing uh, the statements that have been issued. Uh, we're also asking, you know, perhaps your university association or union is staying silent. And we're asking, can you comment on or explain the silence? Also, perhaps your university has links, contracts, and relationships with Israeli private and public institutions, private uh, military contractors, or the Israeli defense forces. In light of the mass atrocities that Israel is committing, what are the implications of these relationships and links? If your university has not adjusted these relationships? Is it complicit in the crimes that Israel is committing? We are also asking what effects are the mass atrocities having on your university and also on academics, students, and others? And how has your, your university responded and with what effect? We're also asking what are the implications of this response? And also, what effect is Israel's assault having on Palestinian students, academics, and others in the university system in Palestine and Israel? And what obligations do universities around the world have towards their own students and towards universities, lecturers, and others in Palestine and Israel? Uh, this conversation is divided into three sessions because of the number of speakers involved and also so that everyone has a, a chance to speak and also so that we get uh, a range of perspectives. The first session is the one that we are in right now, uh, which started at 2 p.m. And for this session, we've got four speakers. We've got uh, Victoria Araj, who is a trade unionist and a lecturer at the University of Lincoln and is of Palestinian heritage. We've got uh, Atwa Jaba, who is a doctoral researcher in international history and politics at the Geneva Graduate Institute. And we've got Iman Hadia Niazi Khan, who is an award winning PhD student studying decolonizing university curriculum from Loughborough University. Uh, London. She has been involved in a number, in, in various student union roles, such as uh, committee chairperson or PSSN, a student trustee, and uh, equality, diversity, and inclusion subcommittees. And we've got Dr. Parasha Ismail Suleiman, who is a doctoral researcher in the Department of political science at the University of Pretoria. So with that as our, our introductory, uh, as our introduction, we, 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 we turn to our speakers. Um, Victoria, we start with you. About 10 minutes? Yes. Yeah, okay. Um, so in cultural cleansing, why museums were looted, libraries burned, and academics murdered, published by Pluto Press in 2009, a debate emerged on the genocide of systems, not just communities. In the case of this book, the education system of Iraq with the illegal invasion of 2003. The premeditated murder of Iraq's intellectual class 
and the wholesale destruction of the higher education system in Iraq was deemed to constitute a new crime against humanity, a crime of educide. It was then proposed by scholars of international law, such as Rula Alusi, that educide should be picked up by the ICJ and ICC. Perhaps if it had been, and there had been some accountability for the crimes against Iraq, uh, there would be not such a resounding silence from British higher education education institutions about the edgicide of Palestine and their continued complicity and their continued role in the military industrial complex. On the current crime of edgicide in Palestine, which I repeat, British universities are completely complicit in, um, Brickup have noted the occupation forces have closed 19 higher education institutions in Gaza, denying 88,000 students the right to education completely. 219 educational institution buildings were completely destroyed, and we have the complete destruction of Al Azhar University, Al Quds Open University, the Islamic University of Gaza. We know that thousands of students have been killed. And we also know that hundreds of academics have been killed. Some of these include the president of the Islamic University of Gaza, Professor Sufyan Tayyeh, um, Professor Muhammad Eid Shubair, and his wife, Rehab. And also we know the situation of thousands of academics who are injured and most are unable to receive treatment with open wounds due to the complete collapse as well of the healthcare system. So what if the Gazan students here in the UK, they suffer from the extreme trauma of not being able to contact or support their loved ones on top of a hostile environment of dehumanization from the universities that are supposed to safeguard them. There's something terrifyingly different about the silence in Gaza's long wars this time. There's a silence from loved ones unable to charge their phones and colleagues who used to message me constantly during previous wars distressed from the relentless bom bombing. Now in this genocide their priorities shift to finding herbs to eat or some dirty water to drink. There is a silence from the wider student bodies too. The mass occupation for the 2008 Gaza war that was so formative for me, replaced now by quiet vigils in universities, along with the resounding silence that echoes loudly from the neoliberal profiteer institutions who loved fanning the flames of war in, Europe, in in Ukraine, pretending they had some kind of solidarity for, for resistance against occupation, whilst being comfortable with the growth in arms contracts that keep the VCs at their golf clubs. These same arms contracts are now being used to completely destroy the whole of Gaza through Educide through genocide, etc. Perhaps I thought the assassination of a scho scholar poet committed to peace would move them. A week ago, the occupation forces targeted the sister's home of 44 year old Rafat Al Arir, a prominent English literature professor at the IUG, and his family. 
He had moved time and time again after numerous death threats, not wanting his public profile to put others at risk. He was killed along with his brother and his children and his sister and three of their children and a neighbour. Not only was he committed to a pedagogy of love with his students, he was committed to a pedagogy of hope beyond Gaza and beyond Palestine. In the website he co-founded, We Are Not Numbers, he elevated the voices of Gaza's youth into the living rooms across the world. A sobering account on the website written by a student of Al Azhar University, Hamza Ibrahim, mourns the loss of his university campus in Gaza. The light of education that illuminates the darkness of my life has been cut off. My memories, my education, and my wonderful days on campus are blown away with the wind and destroyed. The feeling in my heart is like giving the sun a last kiss as it sets into the sea and the darkness comes down all around you. My life has become a dark sky without stars or colorful clouds. Growing up Palestinian, of course, the right to education as resistance and liberation is hammered into our souls. We know the meaning of antifada includes as much renaissance as it does a re revolt. We know that the liberation struggle is as much of a, a, a struggle of, as the pen as the stone. And, in, and at previous times, in fact, lessons would continue, such as during the first antifada, in the, in, in the homes of academics in places like Bed Sahur. In a way, what partly proves so disappointing with dealing with the lack of response from higher education systems is the way in which they cite Edward Said and Men in the Sun and decolonizing curriculums, but they do this through a new white settler lens that silences Palestinians unpublished. The I've effectively been censored out of my decolonization committee and told that um we that somehow Palestine dirties the mud of decolonization. They stole our land, they stole our books in the Nakba, they stole the future of our children, they steal the lives of our students. I don't know why I was so surprised when they actually stole the decolonization concept in and of itself. Nonetheless, we Palestinians are stubborn and we do not let things slide and we will not let them slide. And we will fight back by every means necessary. Of course, the trade union movement being just one avenue. As a student, I spoke at my trade union, the lecturers union conference around 2008 to push for the boycott of Israeli academic institutions engaged in war crimes. We now continue to call the a boycott of Israeli academic institutions. We do not just need universities to demilitarize and to speak out for a ceasefire, we need them to boycott, actively boycott, divest and sanction Israeli um, academic institutions. We also are calling for um, the removal of IHRA as a definition of anti-Semitism, which is something that else that the universities need to do, which crushes debate on Palestine on campuses. We are also calling for academic freedom and academic freedom around terrorism studies, around Hamas and, and 
also we are calling for the so solidarity with those academics who through just doing their job in a lot of cases have been fired we need to demand now and speak up as Mandela who de decorates the walls of our institutions and our fake decolonizing initiatives demanded there's no freedom without the freedom of Palestinians and there's no power and there is no future without education thank you thank you thank you very much thank you and, and then we we hear from from Atwa next hi everyone can you hear me yes um nice to meet you and uh thank you for uh, organizing this important conversation um I'm here with you today. Um, of course, I, I stress on, on everything that Victoria shared before me about the importance of, uh, of academics in, in the fight uh, of the Palestinian people against the current genocide in Gaza, but also uh, the broader fight of, of, of the Palestinians. Um, I'm here with you today to share um, the experience um, which we have faced at uh, Swiss academic institutions. Um, so I speak uh, as, as a researcher at the Geneva Graduate Institute, but I also uh, represent a broader movement of uh, Palestinian, Arab and international students who work, study or do research at uh, Swiss academic institutions at uh, different uh, cantons. Um, and Perhaps it is important to share the, the Swiss case because of the particularity of the Swiss education system. As you all know, Switzerland uh, has been a country which is which has built its model within international relations on the concept of neutrality. But to the, to the surprise of, of many people, especially us who, who study and work in Switzerland, since the 7th of October, since the first week of the war on Gaza, Switzerland has declared its official position on the federal level to align with Israel. Um, and unfortunately, this position um, was reflected at the, at the level of universities. Um, this was mainly um, on the level of um, uh, cantonal universities, so universities that receive uh, public uh, funding, especially on the Swiss German part. Um, on the other hand, um, luckily in places like Geneva, we have faced uh, less, um, so th there hasn't been uh, silencing on the level that, that happened in, in other cantons. But I will share with you um, just a brief overview of, of what has happened. So um, there, there has been attacks. Uh, there have been attacks from from Zionist um, lobbies and movements on uh, students and researchers who work at Swiss universities, Palestinians, but also others who who work on Palestine. Uh, there have been smearing campaigns in the media against individuals, but also against uh, movements, uh, student movements. Um, there were some successful examples of of. Uh, of statements, very strong uh, statements that came out in the first two or three weeks of, of the war on Gaza, such as the one at the Graduate Institute, which is the only, which has the only student association in Switzerland that is uh, part of the BDS movement. But you have other places like the University of Basel, where uh, one statement came out and the next day it was retracted by the university, although it was uh, issued by the students and not the faculty or the university. Um, and uh, slowly, this attack on, on academic freedom, and here we frame it in, 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 in this frame because uh, this is something in, in the Swiss environment, this is something that has that is being looked at uh, not only in the context of Palestine, but because of the Swiss model, which I started by describing, 
uh, it has implications on on the on the entire uh, uh, academic environment in Switzerland. Things escalated slowly, and recently the attacks have reached the level of institutions. So you have uh, one of one of the organizations that is affiliated with the University of Basel called Swiss Peace, which by default uh, does some research on Israel Palestine, is now being attacked by the same um, entities that have begun by attacking students. Um, of course, all of this has not uh, uh, been unchallenged. There is, meanwhile, a very strong movement on the on the national Swiss level, uh, which comprises uh, students, uh, unionists, um, uh, political activists, and even some political parties from different cantos who have been mobilizing on multiple levels. One was one is the demonstration level, meaning organizing the weekly demonstrations, but also on the campus level, um, we are trying to unite as strongly as possible to be able to face this uh, particular moment in, in Swiss academia. Um, I will share with you in the chat right after I finish an article that came out today in Mondo Vice, which summarizes this shift in the in the Swiss uh, position uh, towards uh, the question of Palestine, and which is now uh, resulting in, in a campaign to actually boycott Switzerland as a country because of, of this position. Um, and another thing I would like to share with you, which is one of the uh, one of the ways that we have been trying to uh, to counter this movement in Switzerland is to systematically gather from Swiss institutions um, the particular experiences where students or faculty or researchers have been silenced or on campuses. And at the Geneva Graduate Institute, we have found institutional support to conduct this, this survey by one of the research centers that is um, uh, that has a good position, at the, the least to say, uh, which is the Center for Conflict Development and Peacebuilding. And now we decided to expand the survey uh, or database to include multiple countries. And we're trying to, to reach with this survey, researchers in the UK, France, Germany, um, uh, the Netherlands, uh, Italy, uh, and maybe other countries. So, um, and we look at this as one way of systematically documenting all of these cases of silencing in order to uh, provide maybe a tool or a data set to be able to fight it more, more in, in a more organized way. Um, I think um, I finished my 10 minutes, Brozy, yeah. Uh, so this is in a nutshell is the situation in Switzerland and I'll be happy to, to discuss with you later if you have any questions and I will share with you the two links now which I mentioned in my uh, uh, brief um, uh, speech. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you very much, Atwa, thank you. And then uh, next we hear from Iman. Hi everyone, can you hear me all right? Yeah, yeah so um, um, I'm Iman, I'm a PhD student and doing decolonizing um, university curriculum. I'm currently at Loughborough University London. So Loughborough University has two campuses. There's one in the East Midlands and there's one in London. So I think this adds an interesting dimension to, um, you know, debates and discussions we'll have today is because London has a lot of satellite campuses from main campuses sort of main campuses of other universities. Um, and the culture is very different because we have a lot of international students coming in. They make up the majority of our body, um, even though myself, um, I'm a home student. I am British Pakistani. Um, but that's the sort of environment I'm currently in. But then it's interesting because I can see how the export of the culture of the East Midlands campus is sort of influencing the culture of what's happening on the London campus. So I think it'd be interesting to discuss, you know, how do, um, you know, satellite campuses are influenced by the ones that, you know, they're part of, part of the, sort of the main, main campus that they're a part of. Um, so again, Loughborough University is a predominantly white student body. Um, it is 
tends to be a, a predominant of white upper class Tory students. Um, so you can imagine that's a very stark um, contrast to the environment we have at Loughborough, Loughborough University London. Um, so, so that sort of sets the scene. And what was interesting was that um, obviously when October 7th happened, um, so because I'm very much involved in campus with my student union roles, um, I'm very much engaged with the student body. So, you know, I could tell that everyone on, at least on the London campus were extremely distressed and they were just like, Iman, like what's going on? You know, we're, we're so unhappy. Like, why is the university not saying anything? Um, so um, I said, you know what, like, let's do something. We currently, I'm like, at least on the London campus, we don't have a Palestine society. Um, so I said, okay, you know what, let's do sort of an informal, you know, bake sale for Palestine, because then what we can do is raise awareness. Um, we can um, put some posters up. So I said, okay, let's do that. But what was interesting is that, um, I first, so initially there's sort of two WhatsApp groups I'm a part of. So I'm part of the PhD WhatsApp group. I put in in that um, group chat, um, if anyone would like to work with me and maybe fundraising and organizing any event for Palestine, please DM me. I got reported to the university for that. So I got officially complained. Um, and then I can even read out what some of the complaints said about me. <clears throat> so it said that, um, you know, the student basically was saying that, you know, these these October 7th attacks were prescribed by a terrorist organization and it's worrying this fundraising is being conducted on campus by an appointed rep to the university cohort. So I won't go into full details, but basically it sounded like they're accusing me of sponsoring terrorism by asking to fundraise on campus. Um, and it does bring another dimension of, although I recognize I am sort of very engaged and I'm sort of the face of campus, but I'm also very visibly brown and Muslim. So that does make me an easy target. So obviously this person feels, um, they wrote in the report too, that I'm making them feel unsafe and I get more and more brazen every day um, by talking, just talking about Palestine. And then when I put it in the WhatsApp, um, the WhatsApp group for master students, um, again, there was a backlash immediately by students saying, we don't appreciate you putting your personal opinions on this group. And then other students sort of jumped in saying, OK, first of all, you had no issues talking about Ukraine. Second of all, this is relevant to the university because it's a event on campus. Um, so, again, it was quite interesting how um, the dynamics were and, and how I was being perceived. Um, but then, of course, when I got the report told to me, I was very upset because, again, I was one of the few people speaking about Palestine on campus. But then I was immediately reported and I feel like the university did give, didn't give me any support afterwards for protecting myself, because if the university wanted to protect um, the sort of, um, you know, events that I was trying to do with other students and sort of me speaking up just saying the word Palestine on campus, which a lot of students thanked me for, because they said, no one was talking about Palestine, but you were the first person to say Palestine on campus. Um, so what would the university do to support me to ensure that I don't feel demoralized or targeted as a Muslim woman on campus, just speaking up? Um, there's no current support for that. And um, what else was interesting is that university first made a statement um, on sort of October 17th, so 10 days after, and they first said, and I read, so this is quote to quote, we asked the university colleagues in particular at this time to be sensitive to the emotional distress of Jewish and Israeli staff and students that the university will feel. So they completely ignored the entire demographic of Palestinian Arab Muslim students. And it's not by coincidence, you know, my, my um, PhD research talks about white supremacy and how does that play out in organisations. And, you know, there's so many characteristics which influences, you, you know, like who's seen, who's recognised, you know, who has the right to be comforted. So the university set a very dangerous precedent sort of saying that the, um, those who have the right to be comforted are only Israeli and Jewish students. So despite, you know, um, networks immediately advocating that how could you write this? Um, they wrote a very terrible follow up update where they sort of just said, you know, equally, we ask university colleagues to be particularly sensitive at this time to the emotional distress passing and Muslim staff and students feel. But this was still put in the paragraph after the Israeli and Jewish students. So it does bring the question of, you know, how how genuine is the university's attempts to, you know, even care about Palestinian Arab Muslim students? Um, it comes across as very disingenuous. Um, so. So yeah, then in terms of the student union, 
um, they put out um, again a statement just sort of on 12th October saying, you know, their support for students distressed by the current events in Israel and Palestine. And, you know, all these big statesmen, you know, we understand within our student community that individuals are impacted, you know, we, we take great pride in our commitment to inclusivity. We believe everyone has the right to a safe and welcoming environment. But then uh, myself and another friend, we looked at Loughborough Students Union policy for social media. It literally says you cannot post political content. So we were like, what? As a student union, you have it in your policy. We can't post about politics. But then obviously the, it was completely different when it was the Ukraine and Russian crisis. So again, this double standards are just outrageously out there. It's very blatant. It's out there in the open. We, we can we put it all in, you know, the documentation. And then another group apartheid off Bluffra picked it up. Um, but frankly, it's ridiculous. And then when I started showing the petition on my platform, I was sending it to other student committees. And then some of them received threats from student, from staff at the student union that you will be faced with disciplinary action if you share this petition asking for LUFRA to divest. And then again, just this morning, because I sort of followed up with the student union saying like, we need to talk about your social media policy because how is it that student committees of the student union cannot post a petition that we students have written asking the university to divest of complicity with Australia apartheid? It's absolutely maddening. What I mean, if the student union's already setting that culture, are we, where else are we supposed to go? To the university? It's mad. So that's so that's already the environment that we're in. And then this morning, you know, following up the other conversation we were having with staff, they were telling us like, yeah, like it's not relevant for you for like certain committees to post it on their platform. So you're not allowed to post the petition on those platforms. It's like, OK, first of all, like what's how do you choose what's relevant? How do you choose what's important? How do you choose what's political content? Because somehow apparently Ukraine and Russia on political topic but when it comes to Palestine and Israel you it's it's somehow very political and you really don't care about um you know Palestinian or Muslim or Arab students because the university already set that precedent and it had to be other network um, members you know staff speaking up on behalf of students saying what have you done because again I really I have you know I have no trust in the university to take up student opinion seriously on on you know just the fact that you haven't considered the entire group so how are you going to look after us now so again feels like there's a big culture of silencing on campus um there was a forum last week but again it it feels like it's just a one-off tick box exercise and again like even though the university is committed to the race equality charter you'd think all of these would align with you know the commitments they've made to make sure there's an equal environment for all students especially um students who are minoritized racially but apparently they seem to have forgotten this commitment completely when it comes to the topic of discussing Israel and Palestine and again I think language is very interesting because they always phrase it as Israel slash Gaza or Israel slash Palestine. So again, they are always sort of centering and putting Israel first um, rather than those who are, who are being killed, murdered, and currently in the midst of a genocide. But again, that phrasing of that is ridiculous. And I'll just wrap it up with sort of saying that Loughborough does have complicity with the JCB, um, Rolls Royce, and they have a, they very proudly put the fact they have a 25 year old partnership with Caterpillar. So again, um, there was an uh, open letter to the university saying, um, how, how do you proudly announce um, a 25 year old um, part, business partnership with a company that has uprooted thousand years old olive trees, that has killed um, as people in Palestine, has demolished schools, um, but you claim that your investment policies are based on social, ethical and governance policies. It does not seem to be the case. So we ask for a clear, transparent inquiry into divestment ties because Afba hasn't done that yet. So that's where, what I'm currently working with. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Iman. Thank you. And then we hear from uh, Pirasha next. Hi everyone, can you hear me? Yes. Thank you so much. Um, I'm going to start by I'm just asking by a very particular question. question. And, and that is, um, what is the purpose of the university? 
So if we look at the, the whole question that was uh, labeled out here right at the start for, for this particular coming together, it says do universities have an obligation to prevent mass atrocities? And what is the, in this, then perhaps we should be asking the question, what is the purpose and function of a university? Now for South Africans and for many of us who have just come out of Fields Must Fall not too long ago, we view the university as a highly public space, you know, where you find that the old and new elites mingle. It's also a space where there's enormous political and symbolic power um, that is represented in the overall social order. And during Fees Must Fall, we interrogated these questions based on a common principle that the university is a public good. And if the university is a public good, then how do we shift our perspectives to understanding what knowledge is being shared and is that knowledge relevant or is it commodified and is it for the better of the society and the people? And of course, we came with the push towards a decolonization of knowledge and exactly as Victoria pointed out, this whole thing has blown up in the face uh, of many of us and of course of many academics as well. Because the decolonization of knowledge in the spaces in which knowledge is being produced um, seems to be very hypocritical at the moment. And as Victoria spoke about edicide and epistemicide, this has been a strong discussion in South Africa as well. Because as you are aware, or maybe not, in South Africa, the whites only universities played a very significant role in legitimizing the apartheid regime. It's, it's different structures and components. Alternatively, in the black universities in the pre-1994 period, we found that higher education institutions played an important role, an indirect role, in bringing down the apartheid state by creating the conditions for student political social protest. So if you look at the difference between the two um, universities, I think this should already be raising something in our minds as to what the current state of the universities are in, in a contemporary world. If you look at academics in white-only universities during apartheid, many of them wrote policies and regurgitated, reinforced racist tropes that filtered into the mainstream. But in the black uh, university, the black students at the historically black institutions, um, they were engaging, and the, uh, the black elites were also engaging the very systems and processes that were put into place that was dehumanizing them. What happened was we had, you know, a terrain of student mobilization ideological debate and resistance, which played a significant role in contesting the governing social relations, economic, political, social, and cultural establishments, um, eventually which brought about or which challenged the dominant order, created the, the political opposition movement, and the role of the Black students was a social force for change. So today we have a similar scenario. We have pro-white supremacist ideologies, Zionist ideologies, and Zionist supporters versus the pro-humanity groupings, but it's not two different universities. It's all in one university, which is the neoliberal commodified university. The question here therefore is now, how does one develop the mobilization that is needed to break down the systems that normalize the abnormal? And what we have is uh, students in the commodified neoliberal institutions or multiplexed institutions where the curriculum and the educators in many instances still adopt a pattern of colonial violence. And that is done to dehumanize us, exactly as uh, Victoria has stated. And sorry, I missed the names of the two previous speakers, but they're all experiencing it. And, and when we resist, and that's what most of us are doing, we're resisting or we're lashing out. If we're not lashing out, we're disrupting, and we're disrupting through academic ways, by writing, by holding seminars, by fundraising, uh, raising awareness, etc. It's all non-violent non means. They use a variety of approaches or tactics to argue that we are still subhuman, that we do not subscribe to civilized behavior, and that we do not fit in with them or their centers, their programs, et cetera. And this is happening in South Africa too. Fortunately, I don't think it's on such a large scale because we have a government that has fully aligned itself and its positionality within the BRICS plus groupings, and that is to speak out against uh, Israel and its genocide in Gaza, and also that it is a, a state that has re referred Israel to the ICC. So. But the academics who are entrenched, and this is, you know, those who have come with the savior complex established from the colonial mentality and before, um, they believe that we are not polite enough when we uh, do not address issues with the uh, required level of nuance. So they want us to use euphemisms and not plain English. We must not offend 
or very often the argument is that we are too emotional. Now, what we need is for universities and those who inhabit them to push against the ignorance, the prejudice, the lies, and the nonsense. And I would think that academics like in South Africa, a gentleman by the name of Professor David Benatar, who wrote an article just a few days ago uh, in one of the leading business day uh, newspapers in South Africa, where he said, free Gaza from Hamas which is repeating the typical Zionist uh, tropes, uh, but it's like directly speaking out of the handbook. And another professor, uh, Rebecca Hodes, also a Zionist uh, supporter at my university, the University of Pretoria, who wrote uh, about all the things that have been debunked, the beheaded babies, the rapes, etc. It's shocking that academics who are given professorship at these universities can write such nonsense. And so, you know, we need to ask, should they not be sanctioned for putting out opinion pieces that have no merit, that points directly to the integrity of the academic, but also raises question about who is teaching and who is allowed to teach at institutes of high learning, where so much emphasis is placed on us, those who are trying to, to qualify and get different degrees, where emphasis is placed on us to substantiate, uh, to sub, uh, for substantive arguments to substantiate, to justify, and of course, recently, the whole, you know, hoo-ha has been about derobing, dehumanizing tropes. Now, academics and universities only have power if we give them power. And that is what I saw during FISMA's fall. So just as we name and shame companies and products, we need to name and shape universities and academics who unapologetically promote dehumanizing narratives. And from my personal experience at the moment, and this is the matter I'm coming to, is the matter in which I'm still contemplating on whether to take a legal route or not, and therefore I will not mention the name of my director or the center, but I was told by my director uh, when I wrote, I wrote about six op-eds which were published in very prominent newspapers in South Africa. She claimed that the op-eds were unpacking, and which were unpacking different elements of the genocide and apartheid. She claimed that these op-eds were detrimental to the center because she said our center needed to project an omnipartial or multi-partial perspective. So it's that whole debate about I am neutral or I'm objective. And she has also engaged in tone policing. She didn't like the way in which I responded or I spoke, the way in which I disrupted a seminar on Israel uh, and, and Hamas war exactly as, as uh, I think it was, no, not Victoria, but the previous speaker spoke about framing the way in which the debate uh, or the particular conversation was to be had. And I have been reprimanded for putting content about Palestine on the center's WhatsApp group and the claim that we need to limit it to the main focus. And on Human Rights Day, you know, the center put out a notice basically uh, stating that uh, it's International Human Rights Day and the center uh, recognizes uh, the con that conflicts increase human rights violations and heeds the call to safeguarding basic human rights for all. So that was uh, the tweet, the Instagram, et cetera, that went out on the social media post. And in response, I put a tweet by Yusuf Munayir, which read, Israel's Supreme Court rejects human rights groups request to declare it unlawful for soldiers to shoot at unarmed civilians. And then my comment thereafter was, one has to ask then what human rights? And I immediately received a reprimand from the director to say, I must refrain from putting comments on the WhatsApp group because there are people inside the center who are quite frankly, you know, feel overwhelmed by these things. Uh, and yet we're supposed to be a center that is dealing with a lot of these issues, conflict, peace, et cetera. And also that she, she mentioned that I should limit it to the focus of the center. And I replied and I said, I was just responding to the social media post that was put out on human, on human rights. And then she just said, ah, okay. So on, on human, uh, you know, if you really look at it, the center's previous engagements and participation, which I am part of, took a position in issues exactly, again, as one of our previous speakers mentioned, on Ukraine and Russia, and on LGBTQ rights and opposite, uh, opposing Uganda. But only when it came to Palestine was this, this call for omnipartiality and the claim that it was not in the center's interest to publicly write pieces that could be translated as advocacy for Palestine. So agreed with everything that has been said before. It is about silencing us out of the decolonial space as noted by Victoria Raj, uh, the first speaker. And in my department, we have so-called genocide scholars, peace and conflict and decolonial scholars, all claiming alternative narratives 
Yet it is glaringly obvious that they are nothing but paper pushers, seeking professional accolades of people's pain and suffering. And Gaza has certainly exposed the fake decolonization process. So although my writing had no affiliation in it to the center, and my actual research is very much tied to the core aspects of the center, my director erased my profile from the website. She has been largely unapologetic about it, claiming that she's sorry if she hurt my feelings. You know, I'm really sorry that your feelings were hurt. So this type of belittling rhetoric of too bad your feelings got hurt, but I will do what I want because my Zionist friends don't like you what you write. She openly admitted that she has a Zionist friends. Of course, she didn't say that my Zionist friends don't like what you, uh, what, uh, don't like you what you write, but I mean, it's inferred. And this is the kind of an undercurrent that is pervasive in some of our universities. So while some will be bold enough to try these tactics and believe they can get away with intimidating students, because they control the keys to remuneration and a renewal, others will simply stay silent and try and mask their blatant racism. But in South Africa, there's a positive development. There was a statement put up by UCT law faculty members where over 72 law faculty members signed a statement committing themselves to upholding justice and human rights, the rule of law, and that they were perturbed in, in strong words. <clears throat> they said, <clears throat> We cannot in good conscience ignore the worsening humanitarian crisis in Gaza and the West Bank. So, as you know, in South Africa, <clears throat> the law has been complicit in justifying immoral actions. And this was, of course, in apartheid, but the law justified and condoned apartheid. So we have a duty to ask what is being done to change these practices and how will we ensure that education, which gives rise to the professionals that lead us today, can and will, fact, can and will in fact be relevant and protect all people. That education is not performed in such a way as to favor the elites and to favor corrupt immoral practices. I'm also pleased to say that the University of Pretoria, the same university in which I am, their faculty of law, hosted a webinar with Professor John Dugard, and as expected, the Zionists went ballistic. However, Professor Zozo Diani Mahongo, who is the HOD of Public International Law, actually affirmed everything that John Dugard said. And then finally, we have an open letter to universities, South Africa and the Academic Academy of Science of South Africa in solidarity with Palestine. This was drafted by a whole lot of academics, signed by more than 1200 academics, and they laid out all the issues of the blockade, the onslaught, the genocide, occupation, colonial logics, and, and of course, um, the whole question about the skewed UN system. Now, clearly, in parting, I want to say, clearly academia is a trust. It is about more than just sharing book knowledge. It is about an investment in building human beings. Do we retreat to claims of neutrality, neutrality and omnipartiality in situations of genocide, apartheid, racism, ethnic cleansing? Is there an obligation on us, the academics and the students in the university? After all, the students are the owners of the university. Is there an obligation first to humanity and preserving humanity before we wear our professional robes? And is the contemporary university stressing this responsibility and priority? You know, sometimes I feel that just as the worst of people take up political positions, so too these days in many universities that uphold supremacist ideologies, the worst of academics are given the top positions. The new generation will have to change this from the margins and the peripheries of where we stand and gather like this that we are doing today. We have to find a way to conscientize them and not indoctrinate them. And we have to find a way forward. I hope that we can get more young people involved because my firm belief is that this will only change and the university will only change is when the, when the students, the young generation forces this change. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Kirashan. Thank you, thank you. Um, I, I don't know. Does does anyone want to to come in, comment on, uh, build on uh, anything that we've heard so far? Yes, sir. Hello. Uh, thank you so much. This was, um, I think this is really, really important. And it's quite, you know, um, I think, I mean, 
it's really important, I think, to gather what's happening, uh, but also to find kind of each other and think about what can we do. And I know Brismas has been kind of helping academics who have been targeted and a lot of people have been. And it's, of course, it's kind of extremely scary. Um, but at the same time, it's, you know, you mentioned the fact this, you know, this the pedagogy of hope uh, and trying to kind of stay. And so I, 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 I it's, it's more of a kind of common, you know, uh, is there, I, unfortunately, I won't be able to stay for the whole, uh, for the whole time tonight. Uh, but, you know, if, if there's something that we can do to kind of fight back together to, to yes, force universities to, to uphold their moral uh, obligation, but also um, kind of for us to kind of have more of a, of a network, uh, and, you know, to be kind of more, yeah, united, I think. Uh, it would be nice to kind of think through that in the different sessions and maybe kind of out of this. And thank you so much for organizing this. This is um, very much needed, um, Rose. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. And, and uh, you know, what are some of uh, those things that, uh, that people can do, Sarah, in addition to the networks? What, what else can people do? What else can we do? Uh, we, I think, also maybe you could tell us a little bit more about who we is. In your view. Uh, this is for you, Sarah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. I think, um, I mean, I think it's very good to kind of to to see like to to get together uh, even if it's virtually and given that it's very hard to get to get together physically I think that's very important and I I mean I'm I know there are different signal groups right now they're different um, I mean I don't know how safe WhatsApp is um, um, I don't know if it's worth thinking about I, I know people are from different disciplines kind of um, uh, meeting at the British International Studies Association, meeting at the British Middle East Studies Association. Um, I don't know. I mean, I, I, I think we, I think I would like to think kind of about it together, but I think, I mean, I think there are a lot of people who are outraged. So the we is like, you know, all those who see this as, as, as an app, I mean, yeah, it's part of kind of colonial, um, like Victoria said at the beginning, I mean, this is, yeah, this is a colonial struggle and the settler colonial genocidal system is kind of portraying and it has audacity, which of course, I mean, we know that that's what settler colonial powers do. The US does it, we, you know, kind of pretend itself, portray itself as kind of a righteous victim and, 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 and has, that they have a moral um, stance. And I think that's, again, like this idea that in this kind of this common sense is this 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 supremacist white supremacist common sense that is being used and that's being shoved ev down everyone's throat where kind of those who are occupied are portrayed as terrorists and are portrayed as and anyone who says anything becomes you know is sent to prevent and as their visas are taken away so it is and it's extremely scary for people with uh yeah whose whose lives are here so i think so, and basically anyone who's kind of against that kind of to get together and um, to support each other and to, to recognize the important, because I think the other thing, and then we've been thinking about this at Sheffield, is that we kind of think of, especially when there's a cause that's much big, bigger than, like, I mean, our kind of academic freedom here seems kind of very small compared to what people in Gaza are going through and people in Palestine are going through. So kind of to say, oh, you know, we are under threat here is kind of almost like, you know, we're taking away, that's not the important battle, but actually it is important to do this too. And I think, you know, this, this self-care care rhetoric that comes out of the civil rights movement that comes out of uh, Black Lives Matter, it is important because it is about destroying people and speaking out. So kind of realizing the legitimacy of that and kind of I was part of the effort has to be to, to, help, to help ourselves as well. Uh, and it's not necessarily kind of being traitors to the cause without kind of taking center stage, but 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 having that. Thank you, thank you, sir. Thank you, and uh, yes, uh, Paolo. 
Hi everyone, it's it's a pleasure to see uh, you all here. Some known faces and new faces. It's uh, it's been. I'm, I'm really sorry. I joined later. It's late, so I I couldn't catch the you know the beginning of the seminar. But it's uh, it's a real honor and privilege to listen to your experiences and what you've been sharing. Um, I think it's um, you know going back to what I'm, the question that Ambrose was uh, you know was asking. What can we do? I think it's it's. You know, pretty crucial uh, and quite important. Um, some of you have experienced firsthand, um, you know, repression and violations of your own freedom of speech and, uh, you know, and and opinion. Uh, we all know people who are going through disciplinary process procedures or investigation, or you know, have also been you know fired, suspended, and so forth and so on. Um, so I, I think you know, just to echo uh, what Sara said, I think it's it's really important to you know, to share experiences also because we all come, well, you know, I personally, I'm, I'm based in Ireland, which at the moment is a sort of safe, you know, perhaps safer, <laughs> you know, space or heaven in, uh, you know, Europe uh, compared to so many other places. Although we also have, for instance, news of, uh, I'm part of Academics for Palestine in, uh, in Ireland. Um, and we did have news about a colleague who shared um, a letter that we wrote as Academics for Palestine. We were looking for signatures. So she shared it in the uh, email list of her department and she got a call, a phone call from the head of the department who was, you know, very similarly to what Iman was, uh, you know, was sharing, was reminding her of what, what appropriate is and not appropriate, uh, you know, is this idea of, you know, the university is a sort of neutral, um, kind of liberal neutral space. Um, um, of course, until we come, we have to police, um, you know, certain opinions, then we get very political, of course, especially when it comes to Palestine and Israel. Um, but um, you know, but at the same time, I'm 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 I also work a lot in Italy. I'm I'm Italian myself, and part of the uh, Committee for Academic Freedom of the Italian Society for Middle Eastern Studies. I'm also part of Brismas. Um, so I so I'm saying all of this just because I also wanted to um, suggest that perhaps something that we we should or we could also share are the different ways in which we are disciplined across the different um, you know, countries. Because my feeling is that this change a lot. Uh, I'm very happy that Atwa is here and um, you know, agreed on, on sharing what is happening in Switzerland, because in Switzerland, I think we, we are seeing yet a different, slightly different way of uh, you know, operating where you have universities who are very quick on reacting to this uh, um, I, I can't even call it journalism, this kind of really, really poor, bad, low quality journalism, you know, basically lashing out and slandering people. And they are very quick on, um, you know, kicking off investigation processes and suspending people, firing people, and so, which is not happening in Italy, uh, which is different from, I, I think, slightly different from how the UK uh, universities are operating, where you still have a lot of... As, I mean, you know better than me, a lot of, you know, investigation procedures. Um, so, um, yeah, I don't know. I, I think it would be great to kind of, um, I don't know if this is the right moment, but perhaps it's just a suggestion from me to have perhaps, a, you know, another moment where we can actually share the different ways we are policed, uh, both formal you know, instruments and policing tools, but also informal, which again, I think, you know, vary greatly across the countries. In Italy, everything is in informal, you know, everything is, you, you have these red lines, no one wants to cross them, you know, they are there, but no one is formally policed. Uh, although we have exceptions, and I'm, I'm going to share more in the next session uh, about this. Um, but yeah, this is just to, you know, I just wanted to, to share something that I've been perhaps of interest, something that I've been observing working across different, um, you know, national environments. Thank you. Thank you very much, Paul. Um, does, does anyone else want to jump in, say something before we go back to our speakers? Okay, so since since uh okay, so maybe we we, we go back to, to to that list of of questions that uh 
that we were asking uh, as part of, of the call for, for, for speakers. Maybe we, we, we start with the big one. Uh, are, are universities complicit in the mass atrocities that Israel is committing? We'll start with our speakers. Uh, we'll start the way we started at the beginning. Um, you want me to start? Yes, please. Yeah. So, um, with um, sorry, I'm just trying to trying to. I think what you have to understand as a Palestinian, okay, this is what sort of gives me strength, strength, and it is that we are no different than any other people who have faced the wrath and the dehumanization of a system of colonialism of hundreds of years. You can't separate what's happening to the Palestinian people, to <clears throat> what happened to enslaved people. Um, you can't uh, separate it from the genocide of say the Congo you can't separate it from the whole system of empire and the racialization which in which capitalism emerges um with, through in, in that sort of what what you see very much through a, a crit critical race theory lens and these Sit in these universities, these institutions start off in that vein. So they start off as part of that system of control and part of the, and are really the institutions of the knowledge production of dehumanization. They're the knowledge production of control and they're the knowledge production of empire. So it's not that they are complicit, it's, it's that they are. That is their function, essentially. That the, 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 their, their, their function is capitalism, imperialism, colonialism, and, and, and essentially the control of populations. Um, where you see sort of see resistance to that is in in these in in these kind of not sort of subversive knowledge centers that emerge, and mainly through like the obviously like the black radical tradition, and um through through the different sort of not knowledge centers that sort of emerge and very much outside of the university too, um, not really so much inside, although now the universities tr have tried to steal and co-opt that knowledge, like they love Fanon all of a sudden, when, uh, which is so strange as I was always ridiculed um, whenever I brought up Fanon as, as a student uh, 20 years ago. Um, so I, 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 I mean, it's it's not that they are complicit. They are the occupation. They are the occupying force. Um, and, for, and, and, and British universities, more so in many ways than universities outside of Britain because of the history of the mandate, the history of Balfour, et cetera, et cetera, um, and the lies that sort of came through i mean that the, and the production of those lies as well came from the, the lies to the arabs and to the palestinians um of uh, my great grandfather's time were produced through these institutions and through the, um the, those awful people who um like balfour so, um, and we see as well, like Manchester University was very, Wiseman was there. And we've got, you know, that 
it is the occupation. Um, so I don't think the 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 question is about complicity. I think it is, you know, it is the institutionalization of colonialism, and I think it 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 is how we fight back and what we do as scholars in and I don't like the word activist scholar activist people like to use that I don't like that it's like we're kind of uncomfortable to me but but what do we do as as people who who who've sort of um want to want to resist um this the colonization of of our people who've ended up here as well like myself I speak this tongue etc because of the displacement on my people because of being in the diaspora um and i think it it's it's how we fight back and how we destroy them i mean it's you know i'm you know audrey lord sara ahmed all of all of these say you know these are useless in terms of the liberation struggle however i we still have to survive i i don't know another way to survive outside of this this system and and we've been taught as palestinians education education go to university go to university and essentially we've been almost it's been drummed into palestinians um that that's your safe space that's the only place that's going to 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 um where you can where you can learn and where you can be human but that obviously that's a big lie um and a big another big dis disappointment that but but you but i think it does offer a space for for meeting like-minded people and then building um com communities of, of resistance i don't i don't have any illusions that the universities will change they will continue to be um these the, 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 you know they continue to be the institutions of of of, of neo-colonialism like they they've always have been if it, it without you know they're not going to suddenly have a moral awakening the only thing that we can do is fight back and not in a reformist way but through organizing as workers through organized struggle and through um sort of trying to build a resistance and call for um boycott etc and, and give our students love and give our students strength and give and, and 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 don't lie to our students don't say to our students okay well this is a place that's going to support you this is a no we as 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 we get we need to give our students the tools of resistance and the tools of survival and the only way that we can do that is by not giving them any illusions that the university is going to do anything for you apart from um possibly churn out a qualification if you um abide by the white settler colonial mindset um so, so i think that's really important as well is 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 that that out of these communities we can actually um and and these sort of meetings we we need to understand that that we the sh we need to tell the students the lessons that we've learned the hard hard way and explain to them how they can um also resist and and survive i mean i was one of the reasons that i I've been very lucky this time round, and I've I've still got my job. I've not been fired, um, etc. Was because I learned that as a Palestinian student, I had it. I had it all. So I've not had social media for, for twenty years because I knew because as a student I went through it. Um, and I think there's students now who've just got no idea about those things. So I think it's important that that they're given the tools to be able to 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 resist and 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 survive. Um, sorry for my sort of mad rant, but I th th these institu th th the in these institutions drive you mad. They literally gaslight you 
dehumanize you and you just don't know I, 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 I'm supposed to go and do do my meeting with my my boss after this and pretend that everything's okay and it's just mad it's literally like a crazy weird dy dystopia um it's so it's really strange and and i i was in turkey in 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 2000 and um well sort of from 20 2011 to 2017 and it, it we had a huge witch hunt as well of of academics for peace and academics who stood in solidarity with Kurdish people and loads of uh, like loads of colleagues ended up in jail some with like 100 year sentences this feels to me exactly like that moment in Turkey it feels a hundred percent like that it's like the kind of whispering behind people's backs it's the paranoia and it's the mass criminalization of just being a flipping academic um so i think i think it's you know it's it's not it's not different to to that um uh it's something that that ha that happens when essentially i guess when it, when in, it, imperialism comes under attack from its center and then it doesn't really know what to do so the institution sort of shakes like an earthquake and pushes everybody down um but all you've got to do is just try by any means necessary to be a pain in there and that's the only thing i can say is 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 be the biggest pain in the for them um don't don't let them don't 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 have any illusions that we go that they're going to become moral institutions but we can be a real pain in there mm. thank, thank you thank you thank you Victoria. thank you um uh, how about you uh iman are, are universities complicit in the war crimes and uh, the mass atrocities that Israel is committing. Oh, absolutely. So, I mean, like Victoria said, um, in context of British universities, they are the occupation force and have been complicit from the very start. But I do want to point out that the concept of university, there was actually originally from a brown Muslim woman, Fatima al Bihri, in the year 859 AD. And if we look at what her university looked like, it was open access. It, anyone could attend regardless of religion, gender, race, ethnicity. And that's how it sort of became this powerhouse because, you know, it had all of these, you know, different STEM programs and philosophy. And, you know, that's why the graduation girls look like abayas because it was, you know, um, you know, founded by a Moroccan woman before, you know, the enlightenment of Europe. And that's where the Europeans came into institutions like universities like hers and then took that knowledge. And again, now we tend to associate universities being a European invention, but actually they weren't, and they were completely different to what they originally were before as well too. So I think that's important for the context of what university spaces were looking like before and who do we associate them as, and what kind of spaces do we associate them with? And it does tend to be this Western imperialistic European invention that we think it is, but actually no, it was a very radical sort of, you know, space made by a woman who looks like me, which is unthinkable, but loads of people are really shocked to hear about this fact. Um, so when we look at that context, that this kind of knowledge has been deliberately hidden, and when you when I went to look at Loughborough University's website on graduation as well too, they put statements like oh, these were like founded in the medieval ages. But again, there's no sort of clear attribution, even though it's very clearly documented, even by, you know, UNESCO, that has as the first ever university that's still in operation. So when we have that in mind, and we see, you know, why is this knowledge deliberately hidden? Why is it clearly not credited to, you know, brown Muslim women? And that there's a reason for it. It's the very deliberate, you know, white supremacist colonial um 
environment that has been dominating the world for you know a good two to four hundred years so when we have that in mind and then we think about how are universities maintaining this status quo um it's very evident in the double standards that we are currently seeing and it's quite interesting because we had the ukraine and russian war one year ago so we have a very good and recent example to compare and contrast how does the university react and allow and be responsive to a political, so-called political events in history. So seeing this double standard of, you know, Israel and Palestine somehow being a very different, you know, issue that needs to be tackled in a very different way. And, you know, there's complexities, there's nuances. And now you as a Muslim woman, you don't, your opinion doesn't matter. Um, yeah, international students, we don't really care that you're under this power dynamic where your visa can be revoked if you dare to speak up on any political subject matter. Yeah, it doesn't matter that, you know, in classes we'll have lectures sort of telling you that we can't talk about topics like this, but last one year ago, they had Ukraine and Russia in every single subject area and having seminars about them constantly. So the university very much complicit in maintaining this status quo that is embedded in, you know, classist, ableist, you know, misogynistic, everything really sort of class system that we're in that dominates the world system at this moment. Like we're all interlinked and Victoria has mentioned it before, the prison industrial complex and how does the liberation in Palestine, um, you know, have consequences for the rest of us as the world? And, you know, we see links between Palestinian activists in Palestine, um, you know, um, reaching out to the Black Lives um, activists in the States, because we know that the um, Israel Defense Force works directly with the US um, police force and teaching them how to do um, the chokeholds that killed people like George Floyd. So we're all like linked in this larger global global struggle for colonialism and British universities seem to be the heart of it because when you look at the British public the opinion is pretty much pro-Palestine but then you do have a lot of people who are in this you know misconception and the belief of that oh but the British Empire was a good thing and no the British did never committed genocide so there's this you know we're actually miseducating people currently and universities Although primary and secondary schools absolutely have, you know, they start in earlier on with the roots of understanding who we are and what how the world is today, what it is. But when, you know, the people who are in power usually go to university. So it is a very important point for us to tackle choose how are we actually miseducating people, because like Victoria said as well, we're actually lying to people about what's going on and who we are and who's allowed and who isn't allowed to speak on certain topics. And I think that's quite an important point too, because so many people are miseducated about the British Empire. People don't know about things like Operation Legacy, which was the operation that um, when, you know, the independence wave of, you know, colonized countries were, you know, slowly getting independence. How did the British Empire calculatingly said we're going to burn and the drown documentation that can implicate us of war crimes by the international court in the future how do we retain the institutional memory of the british empire to be what we wanted to be seen which was this gloria era of empire so how come we don't teach things about operation legacy to students at university and come to the actual truth of what was the empire for, how were universities, you know, part of this entire system of reproducing this myth, this complete myth of what the British empire was all about. And again, that links back to how Palestine was again, completely failed and absolutely colonized by the British empire. But I think it just comes down to we're actually miseducating and it's very deliberately so because of this entire global colonial structure that we live in. So I think those are sort of the two points I'd like to add to the discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, how, how about you, uh, Teresha? Are, are universities complicit in the mass so atrocities Israel is committing? So there definitely is um, two components, I would say to that. The first is that I think I feel very sorry for all of you living uh, in the global north. Uh, although your claims, claims to be the most progressive, most civilized, most advanced, you know, the leading 
uh, minds, etc. I actually find them to be very barbaric. And I think that if anything, and savage. <laughs> so the global south needs to teach them a lesson in humanity and in human rights. And I think that has already happened if you're watching carefully what has happened in the international stage, especially with Article 377 at the UN. In fact, that was a complete mobilization of the global south, driven, I think, significantly by the BRICS Plus group. Um, and of course, BRICS Plus groups has been joined recently by, you know, Egypt, uh, Saudi Arabia, UAE, and Iran. And not only that, if you look at the way in which uh, the countries have come together with Yemen, with Lebanon, with Iran, uh, there's a lot of things happening behind the scene. And, and if you, for those of you who've been following social media, you must have seen that the one thing that Gaza has taught us, it has exposed the, the myth of Western humanity. So humanity certainly lies down south, where I am part of it, and I'm very proud to be a South African. Um, and to say that South Africans, and I take my hat off to the South African youth, were actually initiated Fierce Must Fall. Because Fierce Must Fall actually centered the entire discussion that we're having today. And that was about dehumanization, uh, globalization, commodification of the university, relevance of knowledge, et cetera. And so in many ways, I think we would have been very much worse off today had Fees Must Fall not happened. Because with that, there was a push and universities were forced to relent. And the youngsters are becoming quite radical in a positive way. When I use the word radical, I don't mean negative, but a very positive form of radicalization. And I'm proud to say that we are radical. They have are asking the difficult questions. They are not afraid to give their voice and they are challenging the, the, the parameters uh, of silence that is often instrumental when white liberals try to protect their own particular lagers. You know, as you call in South Africa, we say it's a self-preservation. Uh, they, they form these lagers around themselves like the Boers, ha Boers had it during uh, apartheid era. So, but in many ways, in, 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 in terms of the management, that's where the problem is. The problem is that's where the funding comes from private donors, but also the fact is that they, during apartheid, the universities were so clever. They, um, they organized their systems in such a phenomenal way that to break through that, when I say break through that, say for instance, you want to hire African academics with expertise. So say Ambrose, say I want to hire you into the Department of Political Sciences, right? and there's a position open. What they basically do is they already give the positions to the people that they want, which is generally white persons whom who will toe the line and perpetuate the same curricula, the same mindset, exactly as Iman and Victoria has said that when you're in the class, they'll tell you, uh, we cannot discuss those questions that's not relevant to what we're discussing today, et cetera. That happens, that's happening. Um, and so, um, and then they advertise the post and then within four days of the post being advertised, they basically close that post. And when you go into search and you want to apply for the job, it says we're not accepting any more positions. So the, the, the position was created just to tick the boxes to say, you know what, we did that, but no black qualified academic uh, applied for the position. And, and, and that's, what, that's one of the examples that I would like to give you in terms of how the management manages it. But I think that, you know, considering what we've been through as, as South Africans, with Fismas Fall, with the political parties, the younger generation coming through. So although EFF is radical in many instances, they have been instrumental in bringing very important issues to the fore and, and, and socializing and conscientizing the grassroots, the worker unions. And of course, uh, EFF is very strong in many of the campuses. So they carry the same thing. So our university is complicit. Complicit when you have directors like myself, like the, my, my director in the center where I am, where they erase you from the website and they put all sorts of means in, in terms of silencing you. But it, I have to say the landscape has changed in South Africa because when, when the 72 plus academics at UCT put out that statement, there was a big question is, will these academics be sanctioned by the university? Will they lose their jobs? Will they be brought into disciplinary hearing? The university has done nothing about that. They have laid silent on that. They're completely silent on that. And they've allowed that statement to ride. 
and the, then the university statements by the over 1200 academics. So, and these academics are pushing the frontiers of what can be discussed and what can't. So from my geopolitical position, I would say that they are negative elements, but I think I, I, I speak from a personal point, and I think that the youth have changed the way in which um, the university is going to interact with society. And that is what is needed, I think, in the global north, where they have become totally immersed in materialism, in a commodification. I mean, I do believe the American society is completely brainwashed by all the media to which they you know, significantly subjected to. There is an independent thinking, yet some of the most brilliant minds are in the US and we study them in terms of our de decolonial work. But um, it's it's up to the youth and, and you need, I think you need a radical moment in, in the global north and maybe Gaza is that radical moment and I'm hoping it is, I think in many ways it is because if you look at the change in the way, I mean, just today, I've seen how many changes the, the British did you see that that British politician who's who's come out guns blazing at uh, Germany, etc. Um, and and yesterday or day before yesterday was Cameron with a German foreign officer, um, etc. So so suddenly the the story is changing. They 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 like rats, you know, jumping off a sinking ship. Uh, basically, that's what's happening, and and it's a result of the push by the young people. So, yes universities on your side of the whole globe certainly are complicit in genocide on our side i think we're making significant strides because we are f pushing and and in terms of sanction they not so bold and brave as they are in the global north so so there is positive sides to that story yeah thank you very much so uh because this session the time we had for, for this session is almost up that doesn't mean the the conversation the time for the conversation is, is up this conversation will carry on it's just this session so maybe as as final words from and we we end on this note as final words maybe if you could you know just state three things that you would like to see universities do uh, and universities we are talking about the institutions themselves also talking about students and academics and others who work in those institutions. If it's just three words, then it's boycott, divestment and sanctions. I would agree. Um, yeah, if it's just three words, yeah, definitely those. <laughs> How about you, Krish? No, absolutely, I agree with Victoria. I think that's the best way forward. Okay. So, so thank you, thank you very much. Thank you for for, for your contributions. There is is much to to think about in in everything that you said, and um, I agree with you that uh, we need to to hold space for this conversation, and that uh, we need to keep coming back to it until there's change, until there's the change that we we are looking for. So we are going to have uh, our second session looking at more or less the same questions. It's going to start at, uh, at 4 p.m. UK time. And then there's going to be another one at uh, 6 p.m. UK time. And then after those, we will come back to the conversations because we, we are not letting it go. So, so, so thank you and uh, see you in the next session. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. See you. Thank you so much. Thank you.